my opinion, though, he's a great guy and, and did, really did a great job in, in getting the message out about what was going wrong um, in this process and, you know, the unfair attacks on conservative board members. And then Bill Ames, he's going to tell you where all the bodies are buried. He was on the inside of, uh, of this process. Um, I guess that's the easiest way to say it, isn't it, Bill? I mean, you were there on the, uh, the writing almost, team. Almost, almost my body, too. Yeah, <laughs> almost Bill's body was involved. Uh, in the carnage. So these guys have a, a, a great perspective. Will's going to start up kind of giving you the uh, Google Earth view uh, at, at encompassing the whole process and then um, probably tell you, these guys will tell you how you can help in the future. So Will will let you kick it off and uh, I'm watching. I'm watching the time now. Okay. <laughs> Thank you Jason. It's really good to be here. And uh, I don't know how many of you, what things were like when you were in school, but I went to school at the University of Texas in the mid-1990s. And the education that I got, let's see, is this mic on? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The education that I got was very different than what my parents got, who also went to the University of Texas. These days, you go to UT, and there are a couple of exceptions to this rule. But for the most part, they teach you that America is racist, sexist, homophobic, classist, and just about every other is you can come up with. And if you question that, well, you just don't know what you're talking about. That's what our kids are being taught at colleges and universities, and I'll give you a more concrete example of that. We have at the University of Texas African American Studies, we have Asian American Studies, we have Mexican American Studies, we have Latin American Studies, you name it, they've got a studies program for it. So the two or three conservative professors that are left at the University of Texas try to create a program in American institutions, in Western civilization and American institutions, where kids will learn about the founding documents of this country and about the founding principles of Western civilization. The faculty senate went nuts. They went ballistic. And the University of Texas administration eventually shut this program down. Now, when the legislators started finding out about that, it got very controversial. So they morphed it into what is now called the Thomas Jefferson Center for the Study of Core Ideas. They didn't want to mention the words America or Western because uh, President Powers, uh, Dean Deal of Liberal Arts, the University of Texas administration, doesn't think that uh, America or Western civilization should be celebrated. And it's a real problem. Now, of course, the pro what happens in K-12 through education is all of the bad ideas that start up at the top tend to filter down. Now, before we go any further, I probably should tell you who I am. Some of you know me, some of you don't. For those of you who don't know me, my name is William Lutz. Since 1998, I have covered the Texas legislature full-time for a weekly political newsletter called The Lone Star Report. We have some sample issues. We have a website, www.lonestarreport.org. We have a Twitter feed, Lone Star Report. And I have put several sample issues and also a low-cost subscription form, a program we call the Citizen Edition, where you can subscribe to LSR for a fraction of what we charge state agencies in the lobby. Uh, and you can get that all upstairs in our exhibitor booth. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> Oh, okay, well, in any case, um, um, so that's basically who I am, that's basically what we do. And what I want to talk about a little bit, as you know, the State Board of Education revised social studies standards for our elementary school and middle and high school students, and they adopted that earlier this year. That is a very important process, and what I wanted to do is explain that process to you and why it matters. Because the substance of what the State Board of Education did, which is the exact opposite of what you see going on in higher education, they want to celebrate. The members of our conservative, the conservative members of our State Board of Education want to celebrate America. They want our students to understand what Western civilization is all about. That doesn't mean they have to agree with everything blindly. They just want people to understand it and relate to it and, and, and not you know, and have a balanced curriculum rather than what we see in higher education, which is a biased curriculum. But the other two speakers are frankly, have done yeoman's work in making that happen and probably are more qualified than I am to speak to that. So I'm gonna let them do so. But what I wanna to talk to you about as someone who's watched the process for 
uh, over a decade now is the importance of what the State Board of Education does. The curriculum is a very is technically a rule, but it is a rule from which everything else flows. When the State Board of Education adopts the curriculum, the textbooks are supposed to contain that curriculum, and the test, the tax test that we give to our students, is supposed to be based on that curriculum. That is why we elect our State Board of Education. So that your values, the values of the people of Texas, are reflected in what we teach our children in school. Now, the school bureaucracy, most of that drunk the Kool-Aid that I've been talking about that goes on in higher ed. Most of those folks don't share those values. They're anti-American. A lot of them have sympathies for Marxism. And so every session, there are sneak attacks that go on late in the session on our State Board of Education. In 1995, they whittled away its powers, where it used to be the State Board of Education could do whatever it wanted in textbooks. Now, it, it can only reject books that have errors in them, or that don't cover at least half of the curriculum. But there are special interest groups that want to whittle away even that. And here's why. When the State Board goes to adopt a textbook, the yardstick is the curriculum, which is appropriate. But what they do is copies of that textbook are put in regional service centers all around the state. And parents can go look at those books and decide what they think of them. Most citizens of the community can. They can talk to their local school board members about what they think of those books. And they can go before the state board and they can testify at the books. And unlike a lot of other agencies that I go to, the members of the State Board of Education actually listen hmm. to people who come talk to them. Because in the end, you elect them. Now, last session, now, one of the things I've learned about education, and I will say this over and over again because it's important, the politics of education has nothing to do with the kids, no matter how much you hear to the contrary. Let me repeat that. The politics of education has nothing to do with the kids. It is all about which adults get to spend money. That's all the so-called school lobby cares about. They don't care about the kids. All they care about is which adults get to spend money. And we saw an example of that in the 2009 session of the Texas Legislature. We spend a lot of money on textbooks because Texas is a large state. In fact, we have an endowment created from state lands called the Permanent School Fund that goes to pay for those textbooks. Now what's happened is Apple and Dell and Hewlett Packard and Microsoft and what used to be called the American Electronics Association they look at all that money we're spending and they get dollar signs in their eyes. So they put rammed a bill through the legislative session. They've been trying for about three sessions. They got it through last session. That what it does is it creates a loophole around the State Board of Education's textbook approval process for computerized content. And the alleged rationale for this is let's make sure our kids know how to use computers. Here's the scary part of this though. In that same session, the legislature passed another bill which got rid of the requirement for high school kids to take computer classes. So they say they want our kids to learn more about computers, but they take out the requirement that we teach them about computers. This isn't about computers. This is about uh, computer companies making money at your expense. Now, under the textbook selection process, they put these textbooks in all these service centers. In addition to that, the Texas Education Agency impanels teachers and experts from across the state to review the accuracy of the books and whether or not it meets our state curriculum adopted by the state board. And then, after receiving those reports and listening to public testimony, listening to you, the public, then the State Board of Education decides what books they want to adopt. And sometimes there'll be negotiations that go on between the publishers and the um, people in the community and the members of the board. I mean, that board really does listen to your input. You can have a real effect on what goes on in the classroom through our elected State Board of Education. But the computer companies think that process is a pain in the neck. So they passed this bill, House Bill 4294, it's up. And what it does is basically say that if you have computerized content, and under the old law, you could submit books to the State Board of Education either as a traditional book or in computer form. Under the new law, 
If you have a computerized book, you go to the front of the line. What they do under the new law is you bypass the State Board of Education, you bypass this review and accuracy process I described earlier, and the bureaucrats at the Texas Education Agency decide whether your book meets muster or not. And on top of that, it doesn't even have to contain even half the curriculum anymore. What they did it used to be that every kid in every Texas public school was issued a textbook that had either an electronic or printed form that had the entire Texas curriculum in it. Under this new law, the school district has to sign a statement to the Texas Education Agency saying they teach the entire curriculum and give kids materials that contain it, but nobody enforces it. Uh, and a computerized textbook doesn't have to contain half the curriculum. It can contain as much of the curriculum as the publisher wants it to contain. Okay, as if that isn't bad enough, there was another bill that went through last session that said that if a university decides they want to write a textbook, that they can submit it to the TEA, and if they certify that they like it, the TEA has to accept it. So right now we have the traditional process where the State Board of Education reviews and approves books. And we have these two other loopholes that were passed last session that erode you, the public's ability to scrutinize and look at and examine, and in some cases change what your kids learn in school. Because there's another key factor here. Jason was nice to that publisher he talked about earlier. He forgot one thing. Not only were they required to correct the error in their textbook, they were fined for having it there in the first place. Texas fines publishers if there are factual errors in their books. And that is being whittled away basically by a very expensive lobbying campaign at the Capitol. Your right to have some influence on what goes on in your classroom is under attack. Last session, we had a ton of bills that came out of the House Public Education Committee, a ton of bad bills, one of which would have sunset the State Board of Education entirely. And some of those bills came dangerously close to passing. Why? Because the far left in this country, including an ultra-liberal group called the Texas Freedom Network, or as I like to call them, the Texas Anti-Freedom Network, um, which basically their job is to make it as hard as possible for Christians to get involved in the public policy process. That's what the so-called Texas Freedom Network is about. Um, they want that right for you to get involved in public education is under serious attack. Now, the Republican Party of Texas platform is very clear that it supports a an elected state board of education with power over curriculum and textbooks. That's one area where things are really strong. But a lot of times, in the very end of the legislative session, legislators try to sneak a few bills through and hope nobody notices. And that's what the lobby is doing here. And I think the antidote to that kind of behavior is to let people know what's going on. Because the right for the public to have some influence over public education is a very precious right. It is under assault. And I wanted all of you to know what is going on with that. So the victory that the State Board of Education one, in having our students taught the truth about America, the good things about America, in addition to the challenges that we faced. That is under assault at the Capitol. The influence of the board, there are people who are trying to reduce that influence. And also, one of the other things we're going to have to watch is the tax test is going to be revised. And what I've learned about Texas public schools, you want to get something taught in a public school classroom? Put it on the tax test. Yes. So people who are interested in seeing the board's curriculum enforced and taught in the classroom have got to watch the Texas Education Agency very carefully to make sure that the curriculum, that the tax test reflects the curriculum that the board adopted. So that's kind of a large, big picture feature. And now I'm going to let, the, uh, we're going to hear from the other speakers and we're going to learn a little bit more about the tremendous victory the conservatives won at the State Board of Education earlier this year. All right. Thank you, Will. <laughs> Will's been doing some great coverage on what's going on down there. Uh, by the way, how many of you, Will reminded me of something when he started this, how many of you, well, how many of you testified it, have, have ever testified in front of the State Board of Education? Uh, numerous people. Um, I, I, one of the things that I took away from the January meeting uh, when I went home 
that still just lives with me today is when I walked, when I got on the plane coming home, uh, going home to Midland, I was literally sick to my stomach from what I witnessed at that hearing the last time where we had uh, conservative people, Christian conservatives going to the microphone to advocate American exceptionalism and literally being jeered at by socialist um, university professors. We literally had university professors going to the microphone and openly advocating socialism as a preferred uh, method of government for the United States of America and you know basically cheered and applauded by their fellow uh, professors and I, I said we lost America. <laughs> so realize that you've got to be in this fight. You got to, if you've been there before you need to be back and you need to be taking people with you. So. Uh, keep that in mind. Next up, Jonathan Sines from Free Market Foundation, Liberty uh, Legal Institute. Uh, again, did a great job, and we're just we're really proud of the work you did there, Jonathan. Let us know how we can help and what we want. Sure. Well, and first, thank you so much, uh, Jason. I um, started earlier with a handout. Did anyone get this handout? The title of it has just stated the facts. Everybody get a copy of it. No more here. Um, got some extra one over there. And, you know, if you want to send a link to your friends, JustStateTheFacts.com. Um, the reason that we set up this website was for, as the words say, to help people just state the facts about this issue. The biggest problem and the biggest battle that was going on was a battle over whether or not the correct information was getting out to people, um, and that you know largely was was the fault of numerous media outlets, bloggers. Um, liberal advocacy groups that were misleading or putting out information that was misleading. Some of it was just straight up false, incorrect. It was not true. Um, and then people would rely on that and then they would uh, duplicate that. And some of it, I think, um, you know, uh, from the beginning, most of it, if not all of it, was intentional. Um, to get a good headline, to sell newspapers, and not really having much of an interest in the truth. Um, and a lot of that was just not telling the whole story, talking about certain pieces, but then not following up with something else. So we put this out, and this, most of this is countering what the other, what other people are saying that are criticizing the results of the State Board of Education. Um, and so you'll see that in three pages. There's, there's more, the standards are about 150 pages long, so I don't cover everything, but I start off from the beginning with some of the good stuff that the State Board of Education did, and then counter some of the things that you may have heard, like Thomas Jefferson was taken out of the standards, slavery is not covered, those are all false, not true, uh, those things are, and people are covered extensively. But let me, let me, um, let me say this, um, our organization um, has an office here in Austin that I occupy, we work on stuff at the State Board of Education, at the Capitol, on policy and legal issues, that's why we were involved in this, because there were people making claims about, oh, is this constitutional, is this legal, and then what should be in there, and how does the political process work? And then we were also involved in getting people uh, to come testify. And I saw a lot of people raise their hand that they came and testified. Very important, particularly on this issue, as you heard, for people that have kids in public school and so on, or our parents, our taxpayers, to come to State Board of Education meetings. So what we did was try to help educate people about what was going on and then help kind of equip them and then uh, facilitate them getting to the State Board of Education meetings and then testifying. Um, the way I first got involved, our organization first got involved, and tell me if this would bother you. You're sitting at a meeting of elected officials and what they teach students regarding history and social studies, and then you hear that Independence Day is going to be taken out of some sections. Not completely, but reduced in the amount of times they're going to talk about it. You hear Veterans Day is going to be talked about less. You hear that um, uh, Daniel Boone's going to be talked to, is not going to be talked about. And then in subsequent meetings, we heard that Neil Armstrong was going to be taken out of the standards. We heard that Albert Einstein was going to be completely taken out of the standards. At one point, Christmas had a line drawn through it, and so did Rosh Hashanah. Okay, where did those ideas come from to do that? Teachers and professors that were a select group of people that were handpicked. And um, there's more about the process of how that happened and how you can be involved in that. But this is what we were getting from te some teachers, not all, but some teachers on these select committees and professors. One of these professors who was involved in talking about what would happen uh, in US history and what we would teach, 
he testified before the State Board of Education um, that there is no inherent contradiction between democracy and socialism. <coughs> no contradiction between democracy and socialism. That's what he said. And our JustStateTheFacts.com website, you can see a video of him actually saying that at the State Board of Education meeting. So that's, these are some of the things that came up where we felt like, and other people felt like, we've got to step in and make sure that the rest of Texas and the nation knows the real facts of what are going on and how hard State Board of Education members were, were working to fight notable figures and historical figures, the Founding Fathers. At one point, a section that talked about the religious impact on the, on the American colonies and, and our government was going to be struck out. So we saw some of these things happening, and we said, you know what, most people don't know about it. I mean, how many people in this room, before you came to this meeting, knew the State Board of Education was elected? Is anybody that didn't know that? A couple of people, okay? Um, we've got a resource, too, where we show you all the elected officials and so on. This is a huge elected body. Their districts are larger than any other elected official that has a district in our state as far as a state position. So very important for people to be more engaged. I'm glad to see so many hands. So that's what we worked on is getting people more connected with what was going on because we knew once more people knew about this and heard about this, they would disagree with Christmas and Neil Armstrong and taking religious heritage out, all that, and they would also make affirmative statements about teaching about what makes America great, what the real facts are about the Founding Fathers, how religious freedom should be taught, and what the Constitution says regarding those issues. And that's largely the role we played um, on this issue. And a big part of that was the media. Giving the media, and most of that was national. I mean, Fox News played a major part in help setting the record straight. And then um, we were involved in some debates on national television. And I have to mention this, one in particular, I was on a debate with a group that was being talked about, Texas Freedom Network. This was on the Campbell Brown Show, which has uh, been canceled um, so at this point. It? No, it, no, but it was funny because right after this happened, the show was canceled. I'm not saying that had anything to do with it, but it was kind of <laughs> interesting how it happened. And the reason I bring this up, if you go to our website at Liberty Institute, you can find the video. And, and um, The reason I bring this up is because in the video it was talked about what's in the standards and what's not. And there was some debate about the issue of slavery. The State Board of Education at an earlier time period changed some wording on one section dealing with slavery. Even though it was still covered, they changed the way they were wording it. And that was it. But the NAACP and other people tried to make the argument that that means slavery is not going to be talked about, it's being diminished. And it was absolutely not true. And actually, when that language was changed, no Democrats um, who you would have think would have objected, objected to it. So anyway, we're on this interview, on this debate, lot, okay? And, and this was on, third, I think, Wednesday or Thursday night. Millions of people watching, prime time, 7 o'clock. We're on there debating. So Campbell Brown is hammering me on this. Well, they, how can you defend them taking slavery out? I, you know, I said, that's not true. That's not how it was set up. And, and I was trying to tell her, I was trying to just state the facts, okay? And so we went to commercial break after they had tried to beat up on me and I held my position. We come back from commercial break. Campbell Brown says, well, I, I've got to correct myself here. I didn't give Jonathan enough credit. Slavery is actually mentioned in the standards and that's kind of, you know, that's not really what's going on here. And she mentioned to the other group, and I think it's your group, and this was Texas Freedom Network, the ones that are, you know, putting this message out there. And, you know, the woman was shaking her head trying to disagree. But it made the point of what we were dealing with. People were spinning things, they were telling things that were not true. And then when you actually read the text of the standards for yourself, kind of like these other, you know, examples of people not reading the bill, right? This was going on with the social studies thing too. Campbell Brown had to basically say, I messed up and correct herself. And that's when the rest of the interview you could see went in the direction of what the real facts are. And most people realized this is absurd that the board's being criticized for doing things that are so uh, common sense and reasonable. And so anyway, that was uh, a very interesting part of it. And uh, I've taken up a little bit of time here. And Bill's been uh, such an insight and, and a front line on being in those committees where those decisions were being made and trying to stop some of this horrible stuff from happening uh, before the State Board of Education members ever got to weigh in. So, go ahead, Bill. Yeah. Welcome, Bill Lane. So, 
Well, I'm sure it's been a long two days, and I want to thank you all for hanging in there and, uh, with this presentation. Um, today I'm going to begin my presentation with an analogy. In February of uh, 1999, Second Amendment advocate Charlton Heston, you all know who he is, said in a speech to the Harvard Law School Forum, he said, as I have stood in the crosshairs of those who target Second Amendment freedoms, I've realized that firearms are not the issue. No, he said, it's much, much bigger than that. I've come to understand that a culture war is raging across our country. During the past year, I have uh, told my story about public education to numerous groups. But for today, I rewrote my presentation, because after mulling over the events of the past year and a half, it's become clear to me that the situation that we face is far more sinister than just a group of so-called dedicated educators removing Christmas and the Liberty Bell from our history standards. The real story goes far deeper than that. The real story in public education, like in Charlton Heston's firearms analogy, is about a much, much bigger war that we are fighting against those who oppose our American values. Those people wish to implement an agenda to indoctrinate our students, to support the destruction of our free enterprise system, impose big government dependence, and relegate our Constitution and American values to the trash bin of history. Now I know that this is a controversial statement, but I've come to believe that the leftists who have controlled our students' education curriculum for decades are serious about their implementing their assigned piece of the Obama administration's agenda. I speak today as a longtime insider in the textbook and standards review process. Back in 2002, at our host at this meeting, Peggy Venable's request, I reviewed a major publisher's history textbook and wrote a lengthy critique. I found that the Wright brothers' first powered flight and Neil Armstrong's moonwalk were omitted from the textbook replaced by lesser aviators and astronauts whose primary credentials were that they were members of multicultural groups. Hmm. The building of the Erie Canal was described only as an exploitation of workers. The invasion of Normandy was described as a military disaster. What? Well, it was. For the Germans. The Germans. For the Germans. <laughs> That's not what they described. <laughs> all in all, I was able to negotiate some 100 textbook changes to make the textbook a more balanced, less biased view of American history. And although that was a successful project, I realized that I only had affected one of some 200 textbooks that were in the Texas uh, review cycle for social studies during that year. And for that reason, I got myself involved in the 2009 Social Studies Standards Review process, since the standards drive content for all textbooks, or at least they used to, Will. <laughs> I became a member of the U.S. History Review Panel. We met three times during 2009, in February, in July, and in October. Our responsibility was to review and revise the current Social Studies standards, which were created in 1998, and present our proposal to the Texas State Board of Education by October of 2009. Of the nine members of my review panel, I was the only conservative, the only non-educator Texas citizen on the panel. On most issues, I was soundly outvoted by eight to one, and a proposed history standards document was created that was unacceptable to not only me, but to the majority of the State Board of Education members as well. 
I have suggested that the actions of the review panel were a subset of Obama's attack on America. The eight other members of my review panel, if not Marxist and socialist extremists, certainly were willing accomplices to the cause of indoctrinating Texas students with the idea that America is an exploitative, racist place, and thus paving the way for that generation's conversion to Obama's agenda of changing America into a socialist state. I will devote the balance of my presentation to examples that occurred during my review panel negotiations and during subsequent SBOE meetings that will make my allegations so far crystal clear to each one of you. I'll group my comments into four general categories. First, the review panel's efforts to avoid the core principles of our founding fathers. Second, their contempt for military achievements and American patriotism, which they tended to replace with excessive multiculturalism. Third, the leftist one-sided view of history, suppressing the inconvenient truths that conflict with promoting liberal ideas. And fourth, the SBOE's subsequent actions to in introduce pro-American principles into the standards. Let's review my review panel's efforts to avoid the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, and the Founding Principles. America's Founding Principles and Documents create constraints to the left's attempts to imp impose socialism on American citizens. Therefore, leftist academics have a strong desire to omit such studies from our history curriculum so that the next generation of students will not understand the principles that are the basis for our country's founding. In 2001, the Texas legislature mandated a program called Celebrate Freedom Week, a program that emphasized our founding principles and documents to be conducted in the fall in every Texas public school. During the February meeting of my review panel, however, my group, by an eight to one vote, refused to include the Celebrate Freedom Week principles in the U.S. history curriculum. Upon reviewing this omission, the SBOE explicitly directed the review panel to include Freedom Week. My review panel responded by including the provisions but only in the introduction to the standards, rather than in the main line. A move that avoided a requirement that the students be tested on the Freedom Week items. Later, the SBOE conservatives moved the Freedom Week provisions into the main line standards, requiring that the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, and the founding principles will not only be studied, but the students will be tested on them as well. In addition, the SBOE conservatives added the mottos, e pluribus unum, and in God we trust, to the standards. A further constitutional principle added by the SBOE conservatives called for students to study the actual wording of the First Amendment's Establishment Clause and Free Exercise Clause and contrast those actual words with the leftist, ACLU-driven phrase, separation of church and state. SBOA conservatives added the standard, evaluate constitutional change in terms of strict construction versus judicial interpretation. And don't forget the Fifth Amendment. The new standards call for students to study the effects of radical environmentalism on citizens' property rights. A second area to discuss is the review panel's contempt for military contributions and patriotism, replacing such with excessive multiculturalism. The poster child for my claim here refers to the original 1998 standard that reads, explain the roles 
played by significant military leaders during World War II, including Omar Bradley, Dwight Eisenhower, Douglas MacArthur, George Marshall, and George Patton. My review panel, in a fit of multicultural passion, removed Generals Bradley and Patton from the list, saying there were too many generals, replacing them with Ovita Culp Hobby, who was a uh, female leader of, of the, uh, of the women in the military, and replacing them with Benjamin O. Davis, who was a black Army Air Corps colonel who lived at Tuskegee Airmen. Wiser SBOE conservatives later restored Bradley and Patton to the leaders list, but also included Hobby, as well as Davis Tuskegee Airmen, with other groups who played lesser roles in the war. In another obvious attempt to cloud military contribution with multiculturalism, leftist members of the SBOE called for individuals who had earned the Congressional Medal of Honor to be specifically named in the standards. However, pay attention here, only those recipients who were minorities. <clears throat> My review panel had as much contempt for patriotism as they did for military contributions. They demonstrated that when six of the uh, other eight members of my review panel actually wrote an open letter to the State Board of Education dated May 18, 2010. The letter included the following. Our committee work was hampered from day one by Bill Ames who wanted to add a brand new standard solely on patriotism that included school-wide participation and celebrate Freedom Week. Shame on me for being the only American patriot on my review panel. Let's now look at how my review panel attempted to politicize history by presenting its one-sided view ignoring those inconvenient truths that do not promote liberal ideas. Those on the left are adamant in their desire to present history in terms of socialism over capitalism and to promote a negative view of America. There were numerous examples during the workings of my review panel, far too many to discuss today, but let's talk about a few. My review panel assigned nearly all the credit for America's economic successes to government actions. Giving government credit, for example, for mobilizing the private sector during World War II, as well as ignoring the free enterprise system in the science and technology section of the standards. The SBOE fixed these omissions by crediting uh, private industry for mobilizing the World War II effort for manufacturing process and improvements such as assembly line, such as computer manufacturing control, as well as uh, uh, crediting the free enterprise system for innovative products that we have today such as cell phones, inexpensive personal computers, and GPS positioning devices. In another area, there was great debate over U.S. policy during the 19, 1898 acquisitions of Cuba, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, the Philippines, and Guam. My review panel voted to change the 1998 standard from U.S. expansionism to U.S. imperialism, reflecting yet another desire to present America as an oppressive country. The SBOE directed the review panel to revert to the original expansionism term. The review panel refused. One angry <laughs> review panel muttered, let the board do it. And although a case for some debate can be made regarding American expansionism versus American imperialism, the review panel later lost all its credibility when it, in an anti-American temper tantrum, substituted Soviet expansion for Soviet aggression relative to the USSR's military takeover of the Iron Curtain countries after World War II. 
So in the ideology of my review panel, US, U.S. acquisitions were imperialistic, but the Soviets' military takeovers were only expansion. In another example of historical negativism, the review panel added a standard that all but condemned the U.S. for the Cold War. As usual, for the left, McCarthyism was the chosen whipping boy. Ignored by my review panel were the findings of the House Un-American Act, uh, Activities Committee that dozens of communist Soviet agents occupied high government positions and how the Venona Papers ultimately exonerated Senator McCarthy and the House Un-American Activities Committee. SBOE conservatives ultimately balanced that standard. In the discussion of the civil rights era, my review panel refused to acknowledge the inconvenient truth that more Democrats opposed civil rights legislation than did Republicans. The SBOE addressed this by including Democrat governors George Wallace, Orville Faubus, and Lester Maddox in the standards along with the Congressional Bloc of Southern Democrats as those who sought to maintain the status quo. The SBOE balanced the civil rights advocacy groups by calling out the extreme actions of the Black Panthers in contrast to the passive approach advocated by Dr. Martin Luther King. My review panel treated the great society as all good crediting it with expanding opportunities for all citizens. They refused to consider the devastation that that program caused to inner city families, creating generational welfare dependence, fatherless homes, illegitimate births, and the resulting poverty and crime. The SPOE conservatives addressed this inconvenient truth because students will now be required to study the unintended consequences of the Great Society in addition to any benefits that it created. The media and leftist educators went crazy over the SBOE standard uh, to recognize the conservative resurgence of the 1990s and 1980s, claiming that there were no balancing liberal entries. It seems they ignored populism, the progressives, the New Deal, and the Great Society, all liberal initiatives, and all covered in the standards. Time does not allow me to describe all of the inconvenient truths ignored by the left, but added to the curriculum by SPOE conservatives in order to give students a balanced view of history. But here's a few more examples. Students will study eugenics, a progressive initiative to achieve racial purity by sterilizing blacks and poor people. Woodrow Wilson was a leading proponent of eugenics. <laughs> In addition to the internment of Japanese during World War II, students will learn that significant numbers of Japanese and Italians were also interned as well. And this in in inconvenient truth changes internment of the less claim of American racism to one of national security. Students will study how global organizations, such as the United Nations, undermine U.S. sovereignty. Students will analyze the solvency of long-term entitlements, such as Social Security and welfare. And rather than co confining discussion to the alleged benefits of the New Deal, students will study both the pros and the cons. These are just a few of the inconvenient truths that the left would omit from history. Thanks to the diligence of the SBOE conservatives, students will learn about them. Fourth area I'll discuss relates to a few key items that the SBOE added to the standards to teach students that the American story on balance is overwhelmingly positive. The left does not see it that way. As an example, the standard developed by re my review panel focused on an exclusively negative view of America is seen through the eyes of the muckrakers and the social reformers of the 1890s. SBOE conservatives later balanced this standard 
with a standard requiring that students study the, uh, the uh, optimism of millions of immigrants who sought and found a better life in America. My review panel was so negative on the notion of a standard recognizing those individuals who had achieved the American dream that one member moved to add investment swindler Bernie Madoff to the list. Folks, you can't make this stuff up. It's in the meetings of the, the minutes of the meetings that we have. The SBOE not only reverted to the original names, but added millions of small business entrepreneurs who achieved the American dream as well. Finally, the SBOE added the standard on American exceptionalism, the notion that America is different and unique from other nations. Anti-American leftists literally gag on this uh, American exceptionalism con uh, concept. It's hard to believe that any American does not believe that we are exceptional. But the reason is best described by a recent quote by Chester Finn, who's president of the Thomas B. Fordham Institute, a nationally recognized education-focused think tank. On September 4, 2009, Mr. Finn commented, if you are a left-wing Marxist group, you want students to grow up thinking that America is an oppressive capitalist plot against the working class. So there you have it. America's greatest hope lies in the hands of our children, and in those hands like the courageous conservative members of the State Board of Education who inspire students with a positive view of our country and our heritage. So what can you folks do? First, you can support SBOE conservative candidates Ken Mercer, Ken Mercer and Charlie Garza who face liberal opponents in the November 2010 election. Second, you can testify at your local school board meeting in favor of the new standards. I have brought with me enough copies for everybody of a script that you can use as a starting point for your testimony. I'll close this afternoon by revealing why I have done all this work. I have three grandkids, ages 11, 12, and 13, who attend public school in Texas. When they take U.S. history, they, along with hundreds of thousands of students in Texas, and perhaps across the nation, for the next 10 years, will learn that America is a nation that they can be proud of. Thank you for your attention. Some questions, and let me tell you something. Mr. Ames made me uh, said something that made me think of uh, back to 2000 when we got involved. One of the things that was most shocking, and why you should be involved, is that when you have kids being educated um, in a way that is literally is going to alter the course of America, uh, you need to know what's going in the books. And the thing that shocked my wife and I the most is when we read in a science textbook in 2000 uh, that. Uh, by, they made a prediction in this book, the science book, that by the year 2020, I think it was, that the world would be so overpopulated that we were going to have to think of ways to humanely control overpopulation. So, why you should be involved? So your kids don't think they need to smother you at night <laughs> to save the planet. See, what other reason would you need? Anyway, uh, question. Yeah, uh, Bill. Uh, one of the things we discovered uh, this year was, uh, or brought out rather, was that uh, the teaching of American history is split between the 8th and 11th grades at 1877. Uh, history before 1877 is only taught in the 8th grade, and then it picks up in the 11th grade, 1877 onward. And perhaps you could care to comment on this and uh, what the impact is on the teaching of American history to our kids. I, uh, uh, I agree that 
having the, uh, the pre-1877 history taught to an eighth grader uh, is, uh, is almost a lost cause. My 13-year-old granddaughter took eighth grade U.S. history this year, and, you know, although she is a super student, on a roll, she doesn't have a clue about founding principles. She just isn't old enough, not mature enough to have that experience base to be able to really absorb it. Uh, that's the bad news. The neutral news is that, that, you know, that's the kind of change to keep hammering to the, uh, the state board and the curriculum writers. There were lengthy discussions in my review panels about it, and it was kind of a give up, you know. You're not going to get it done this time around, so let's just keep banging away at it. That's the neutral news. The good news is that uh, I read last week that the New York State publication or public education system is kind of dropping history altogether. <laughs> and, and in North Carolina, they're dropping the pre-before uh, 1877 piece. So, you know, we may be in bad shape, but we're not as in bad shape as, uh, as some of the other states uh, uh, yeah. that we're working with. Yeah. I can speak a little briefly to that. That change was made in 1997 as a result of the rewrite of the essential knowledge and skills that occurred in that year. The Bush administration is largely to blame for that. The conservatives on the State Board of Education at the time were not a majority and did fight it. Uh, Bob Offit, who was a member from San Antonio back then, actually got John Shields, who was a state legislator, to pass a state statute requiring that they put the stuff about the Founding Fathers on the tax test. So it's not technically part of the curriculum in the 11th grade, but it is tested in the 11th grade, and that's the only way you can guarantee something gets taught in the public schools, put it on the tax test. But that was put into statute, I think it was either 99 or 2001. Bob Offit tried to make a proposal to change the graduation requirements so that they had a three-semester course in American history that started at the beginning and went all the way to the end. Uh, that never got a majority support on the board, but it was something that was bitterly fought over in the late 90s. and. The funny thing is, once Bush went off to Washington, the politics changed on all of that, but there was not much of an effort to try to fight that battle again. So what was the best time to have before 1877? 12th, um, not 10th grade or something? Well, interestingly enough, students who take the advanced placement, because that's nationally done, um, actually do get the whole story. Um, Offit, in his original proposal, did not specify where in the high school. He wanted a three-semester American history course. He did not specify in what grades it's taught. And actually, technically, the current course that was, des that was designed in 95 was designed to be an eighth grade, ninth grade course. But the statutes itself don't specify in which grades you teach the course. Theoretically, you could teach U.S. history in any grade. Uh, it's just most school districts have chosen the 11th grade to teach that subject. Uh, by the way, I'm, I'm going to tell you guys that if you didn't know this about Will, Will Luke already, if you ever want to see a walking encyclopedia, this guy is it. I, I cannot believe the stuff this guy can remember. It's amazing, Will. It really is. It's impressive. So I get all kinds of good information from him. Uh, yes, sir. Um, my, my family, we homeschool. We've got two children and we homeschool. My wife was a, a public school teacher for 10 years and then decided to homeschool our kids. Can you tell me if the impact you're having on the Board of Ed and the TE, I'm still struggling with those two, uh, how that may trickle down to laws around homeschooling in the state of Texas? Jonathan. I don't think that, I think we've got such strong protection for homeschoolers in the state of Texas. I don't think there's a, a concern as far as in law or policy, but I will tell you, I think that what standards we have at the public education level can have an impact on other things that are produced, publication. One thing that we've seen that drives a lot of this issue, some of the tug of war going on, is, um, is the purchasing of textbooks. Because the curriculum standards have a big impact on what actually goes into the textbook, even though uh, the textbooks are much larger and cover more detail and material than what, what, what actually is stated in the standards. They go beyond that. Um, so what I'm getting at is sometimes money can have an impact on that. And if you see a lot of the textbooks 
and you see a lot of publications reflecting standards that are very solid in regards to history, social standards, standards, founding fathers, um, that's good. That means it's less likely for you to see some negative things having an impact on homeschool curriculum that maybe that's being produced by people, which I think you probably will find reflects more respect towards founding fathers, more respect towards um, history that's balanced and talks about things without looking through the lens that the, uh, the liberal left does when they try to produce this curriculum standard. So, um, so I, um, I think that the homeschoolers are safe, but I also tell people, let's always remind ourselves, public policy sends a message. What government says is okay sends a message to the rest of the people of this is okay, this is what's allowed, this is the standard from which to draw from. So it can have an impact on other areas, maybe indirectly. Uh, I'll neither. Yes. Uh, I wondered how this esteemed panel of nine liberals, or well, eight liberals, were appointed. Where did they get their, where did this come That's from? That's actually a good question, and Bill will follow up with that also. Did he, I think you told me one time that there was, um, is it state law or education code or something that says the makeup of these panels should be, tell, talk, talk about that. The, uh, the Texas, is this, this the Texas Education Code requires that these review panels be made up of equal representatives from the teaching community, from the business community, from the uh, industrial community, from parents, and, you know, just schlock citizens like myself. Did that happen? Uh, that did not happen. The Texas Education Agency, when it's time to start to create one of these panels, like the one I was on, sends out uh, uh, the word that, you know, asking people to sign up. Well, guess what? They go to the school boards, they go to the Texas Association of, uh, of Education Administrators, they go to the teachers' unions. There was not a request sent to any chamber of commerce that I ever learned about. So these people all fill out the, uh, the applications and send them all in, and the TEA ends up with a big stack of education, of, of, of forms, from people who are basically education activists who want to get involved and impose their will on the Texas education system. That's what happened. So all these forms came in, and then they get distributed among the SBOE members who then nominate candidates. Well. The left group says, I like all of these, and, uh, and uh, one of the uh, leftist members of the board nominated 17 people out of the 100 who were on the board. Some of the conservatives said, I don't like any of these. All right. David Bradley uh, nominated a couple of his friends going around the system. Don McElroy nominated me going around the system. I was originally rejected by the TEA because I have a reputation in that group that they don't like. Yeah. And so that's what happened. And, and there can be blame placed on both sides. Who did the uh, TEA send groups out to? And then, frankly, the standard, the State Board of Education conservatives could have done a better job in terms of getting their own people on those committees, because by the extreme left-wing bias that was on the committees, I mean, the, 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 uh, the state board conservatives kind of dug themselves a hole by having these unacceptable set of standards uh, uh, put in place. And the left, you know, loved the standards. They were put in there by reputable, hardworking educators. And the state board had to dig its way out. And every time they changed something back for, for positive balance, they were ridiculed by the press. That answer your question. Jonathan, is that, is that some way that you guys can be involved in the future to make sure maybe that you guys help be a distribution point, maybe for applications, for people to be on these writing teams and standards and all of that? Well, I, I think that all of the things that we've seen with science and social studies has enhanced or upgraded people's awareness of the State Board of Education. Uh, the functions, what it means, the implications nationally that it has, because a lot of the standards and textbooks that we get in Texas 
other uh, states adopt. You know, the liberals are trying to spin it now and say, oh, because of technology, there's less of that. Well, you can't have it both ways. You can't beat up on Texas because you say we're going to have an impact nationally and then try to say, oh, now that we lost, liberals saying, oh, we lost now, so actually it's not going to have that much of an impact. No, but, um, yeah. but, so, um, so I, you know, that's something that we'll continue to watch closely. Um, but we're a, a, we're a point of communication, of getting information out and, and reaching folks. Uh, but we, but it still is going to require people within individual communities to then say, I'm willing to step up. I'm a professor at my community college. I'm a professor at a local university. I'm a teacher in my school district. And have the, um, you know, comfort to go forward and put yourself out there. Um, if you'll notice that there were very few people that were on any of these review panels that were actually named. They weren't in much of the limelight as far as the scrutiny, uh, sometimes for better or for worse. Bill was the exception, maybe Professor Naboa, who was uh, from the University of Texas at El Paso, who was the professor that said there's no uh, con inherent contradiction between democracy and socialism. He was on that U.S. history panel. Um, so, uh, so I say that to say, you know, a lot of these folks are unnamed. It's not as if they're going to be out in the public. It's an important position, so think about that. And I want to mention two other things, if I could, because we're probably getting short on time. Where we go from here. Um, the reason we have social studies standards that make sense, that didn't reject Christmas and didn't reject Neil Armstrong and the Liberty Bell and religious heritage and some aspects of our founding fathers, and, and the list goes on, is because we elect our state board of education members. Okay? And, and because the ones we have now, the majority of them, and, and the majority of which were the conservatives, are leaders and they showed leadership qualities. But my point is there's an effort to eliminate having our State Board of Education members elected. That's going to happen during the 2011 session. There are members of the House and Senate that want, they want, they also want to take away powers from the board to do what they've been doing, have these hearings and, and review the curriculum. They, there are some people that want to turn all this power of what's in our curriculum, what type of textbooks we have, and what the vetting process is like. They want to turn that all over to handpick professors. And they want to let them make all this decision without any accountability at the ballot box. Okay? All these issues we're talking about got national and international news. It also generated a whole lot of emails and phone calls mm -hmm. from constituents in these elected officials' office saying, you better remember what history is about and it better be taught accurately. And also, we stand with you supporting the right way history should be taught and not allowing the ACLU and atheist takeover of writing our curriculum standards. And let me mention one other thing, and, I, and, and Bill touched up on this a little bit. Educate yourself about your local school board and make contact with those members. Okay, They're, and, and get, the, get this into the hand, their hands. What Bill gave you, this Just State the Facts document, in late September, the Texas Association of School Boards is having a state convention. All these people that are on local school boards are getting peppered with information condemning and being negative about the board because they there are liberal groups that want to pass resolutions or people that are on the left that want to pass resolutions to undermine and criticize the State Board of Education and and from what I can see it's based on false incorrect information so let your school board member know you know the real facts about social studies and you want to help equip them before they get ambushed mm -hmm. at this state convention in September okay. Got one right down here, real quick. We'll take a couple more, and then we'll let you go. If you want to ask questions afterwards, then we can do that. I'm uh, presently enrolling in a um, an alternative teacher certification program, so I can uh, teach in public high school. And uh, one reason is I've seen, even in our textbooks, which do have like uh, strengths and weaknesses in some places, uh, I think. A lot depends on the teacher how much of that actually gets filtered into the students, what they see. And I can, I know I can take that ball and run with it. Um, is, is there any, what do teachers do? I mean, if I have a textbook that I know has got a lot of drill in it, but I have other sources, they don't let me disregard the textbook and bring the other sources as long as it teaches to the standard or to the text. I hear a lot of comments that teachers don't use the textbooks to the extent that I guess I would assume they would. Uh, one of the strengths of the standards, uh, and, and I heard this from the school board members in the district in which I live, 
they were, they had the same brainwashing that said, you know, the standards are all politi politicized and the state board screwed up and did all this bad stuff. But in the same breath, they said, we have to teach to these standards because if we don't, we're going to penalize the kids because they're going to be tested on that stuff at the end of the year. And so if they aren't exposed to it, you know, we're, we're hurting the kids. Well, but the test, the, the kids take the tax, but it's the teachers that are getting graded. Well, they both are. Yeah. Well, uh, maybe that's another positive for the... Yeah. Well, I, I, will, I will say this, too, in response to your question, is that um, what Bill's talking about has exposed kind of this dirty little secret that a lot of teachers are ignoring what's in the textbooks and, and really making a mockery of the whole process that the State Board of Education goes through in public citizens testifying and professors and teachers if they're going to just ignore what's in the textbooks anyway. And some people may say, well, that could work both ways, you know, could be good for conservatives to do that if we don't like this, and liberals. That, I don't think that's a smart uh, policy for teachers to be engaged in, in something that I think undermines the system and, uh, and really you know, shows a disrespect and something that I think is, is very dangerous, but we've heard a lot of that, of teachers saying, well, we're, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll ignore what's in there anyway. Let's grab one more official question and then we can uh, release it. I'd like it. to make a comment too, if I may. Okay, go, go ahead and ask your question. Okay, I've got one observation very short and one question very short. The observation is, maybe it's a question too, about somebody saying that democracy and socialism uh, are um, compatible. Are these folks that maybe they're talking about the participatory democracy, like of Hugo Chavez, where what they're trying to say is democracy means the government owns everything and therefore not the people vote and we supposedly have everything for the people. I'm just wondering if that's what it is. is Mr. Naboa, in his testimony at the state board that Jonathan just referred to, uh, was asked uh, what is a good example of a democracy and, uh, and he uh, referenced Venezuela mm -hmm. and Hugo Chavez. Yeah, like so that kind of exposed what uh, his deal. I'd like to make a comment, if I may. I don't think, I don't, I, I want you all to know that, that, that we are not, we don't want to create the impression that all teachers are doing bad stuff. Because I, I still am optimistic enough to believe that most teachers out there are trying to do the right thing and teaching our kids that, that we live in a great country in, in history. But there are definitely bad apples, and I saw them, and, and I am very concerned that the people who were on the review panel with me were teaching our kids. And the sad part is that the conservative teachers who believe as we do tend to be silent, and the ones that are making the noise are the ones who are on the liberal left. And, and of course, that's not something that just happens in education. That happens in a lot of other areas as well. Yes, ma'am. Okay, that's, that was my question. My brother, who was a Baptist preacher, is now in the second year of public school teaching in the fifth grade. He is as conservative as, as can be. He's going to lose his religion. History. And yet he said to me, uh, the SBOE is basically irrelevant. They do a bunch of dumb stuff. What do I say to that? Ask him to give you a yeah, specific... Based on what? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I'm, I would be better off be, being able to send him somewhere where he Just can get information that. rather than a fight with his sister. Yeah, well, I mean, and one thing you could do is you could direct him to the, our website where we counter what's being said, because here's the thing, okay? Um, you have this elected body, like we've talked about, State Board of Education, not only having an impact on the curriculum in our state, but ha you know, I think it's fair to say having an impact on curriculum or textbooks in other states. You have close to five million students in public schools. Maybe to him it doesn't make a difference because he doesn't understand what they do and what their function is. Let's assume he does. I don't know what his reason for saying, you know, whatever they do is, is irrelevant. Um, and maybe that some of that is because in the you know it's really about what teachers are doing. But when teachers are held accountable, they're held accountable by our, what's in the standards if they're teaching that, the tests, the, the textbooks. And so we have a situation where 
He may need to know a little bit more about the process to understand that. Right, and so I send him to... Yeah, well, there's a little bit of that on our Just State the Facts website. But the TEA's website has a lot of detail about what about who the State Board of Education members are and what their roles are, if that's maybe what you're, you're looking at. And so, um, because it's not just social studies, it's science. They're going to take health up next. The TEA website? Yes, Texas Education Agency. They've got it on that website. Then there's a link that is just focused on State Board of Education. Okay. okay. So, so it's, you, it's straight up on there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's the, the information about their role and their function. Next, uh, or coming up very soon, is the debate on health, what the curriculum looks like that. And that brings up issues of sex education. So okay. That, as we wrap up here, I want you guys to tell real quick how people can get a hold of you, your website, those kind of things, so that people can... Uh, Go check you out, Will. www.lonestarreport.org, and my email address is L-U-T-Z, my last name, at lonestarreport.org, and it's .org, not .com. I'll, uh, I'll leave some business cards here. My email address is Bill Ames, A-M-E-S, all one word, Bill Ames at prodigy.net. Right. And if you got my handout, it's all on there on the front, libertyinstitute.com and juststatethefacts.com. And you can find me at citizenwatchdogs.com or on Twitter. Hey, you're, on, you're on Twitter. Yeah. I'm at Captain Watchdog. So how about you, Jonathan? Where's, what's yours? Uh, JS underscore free market. JS underscore free market. Thank you, guys. Oh, yeah. By the way, I've been meaning to call you back. I got tied up with my two conventions. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Two conventions getting a disagreement with your comment about the network. Right, right now they do.